on our uh, MC for the day, uh, Sinclair Harris from the Hudson Bay Route Association in Canada, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, as was indicated uh, from Canada, from the Hudson Bay Route Association, I have uh, three of my colleagues with me, but they've left already. There's one right there, Jim Birchai from uh, the Paw, Manitoba. Uh, Jim was at the summit last year, and so was uh, Albert Nabe. He'll be coming in here in a minute. And just some of you were at the summit last year in Bismarck, which was held in March, and we were so uh, enthused about uh, transportation hubs. We went back to Canada and uh, decided to set up a meeting in the Paw. And that's where the CN Rail meets up with the Hudson Bay Rail. And we had a meeting in July uh, to set up or make the plans to uh, have a transportation hub in the PAW. So uh, th that's the kind of thing that can uh, come out of meetings like this. We've got, uh, I believe, on the agenda, which I will uh, get to here, they're not going to be here in person, but uh, Senator Heidi Hen Camp and uh, House Representative Kevin Kramer. They are going to come in by video conference. And this lady right over here is going to do the magic. So I, Heidi is. Hello, coming. everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person at your summit, but work here in Washington prevents me from being there in person. I couldn't think of a more timely conference than the one you're having right now. Both transportation and trade are hot topics in Washington, as, uh, as you know. Unfortunately, Congress has not done its job providing North Dakota and the country with a long term highway bill. That is something that we should be doing and we're not doing. I think we all know our highways are critical to the success of our economy, from getting our kids safely to school to shipping products up to Canada. And as you know all too well, our roads and bridges are in serious need of repair. I don't have to tell you that infrastructure is important to our relationship with our neighbors to the north. Canada is our top trading partner with more than $143 billion traded between our countries so far, so far this year alone. Obviously, North Dakota gets a good share of that business with exports ranging from crude to tractors to oilseed and imports ranging from egg products to cars. We know that infrastructure is critical to getting our goods to market. We saw firsthand what happens when the system melts down last year when the railroads couldn't get our farm products to market. Our farmers paid the price, and so did our consumers across the country and the world. Thankfully, the railroads have stepped up and are making investments to try and prevent this from happening again, and I'll keep pushing them to make sure that they live up to that commitment. I'm, uh, I'll also keep pushing my colleagues for a long-term fully funded highway bill that provides long-term funding for the Highway Trust Fund, not through short-time or one-time gimmicks. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the hot topic in trade right now. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, and Trade Promotion Authority. We'll be considering TPA soon in the Senate, and I understand the importance of trade for our state. I am still decidedly undecided on both, as it's critical that TPA be done in a way that promotes exports as well as ensures our workers are kept on a level playing field with foreign competitors. Thanks again for the invitation to speak. I hope you have a wonderful and productive summit. Know that I continue in Washington, D.C. to uh, draw attention to the northern border, talk about the challenges of the northern border, but also talk about the incredibly strong and historic relationship that we have with our neighbor to the north, Canada. And so um, thank you so much for giving me a few short minutes to speak to you today. Well, good morning and welcome to the beautiful campus of Bismarck State College. I know you're all enjoying that tremendous view of the Missouri River, and I'm enjoying the tremendous view of a 
TV camera. But anyway, I wish I was with you. But unfortunately, my legislative schedule doesn't allow me to be. But I congratulate you, and I appreciate so much the, uh, that you're all together and working on very important issues, similar, frankly, to some of the issues we're working on. You know that, uh, as you know, we're working on a, a trade promotion authority, trying to give our president and our negotiators the tools that they need to um, work so that we can work together as a continent, uh, selling our product, marketing our products uh, to uh, to other people in other parts of the world that have a high demand. And we know that the, the jobs that go along with trade uh, pay on higher, a much higher uh, wage than, than jobs that uh, that are not related to trade. And so we're we're struggling. We're working with. Uh, with our friends on the other side of the aisle, as well as the other side of the Capitol, as well as the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue, on uh, trying to come up with some sort of uh, a TPA bill that everybody can agree on. Uh, other important issues, of course, uh, uh, not the least of which is a, a highway bill. We've been struggling, as you know, a little bit uh, in the Congress to uh, find a way forward to have a long-term highway bill. There, everyone's committed to a long-term highway bill. The challenge, of course, has been how to fund it in a sustainable fashion. We just did a, a two-month patch based on the existing uh, highway trust fund solvency, but we need to do something in the longer term. I'm sure you've picked up some of the, the uh, rumors, if you will, that uh, there's everything from perhaps a tax holiday that would incent the repatriation of some stranded uh, U.S. profits stranded overseas as a result of our very unfavorable uh, you know, uh, tax uh, tax structure in the United States. Um, I prefer that we do that in a more sustainable fashion. I think we can maybe get to that point if we open up the international side of our tax code, perhaps uh, become more competitive in the, in the global marketplace with a, a lower business tax that, uh, that attracts our capital, attracts our, our investment here in the, in the United States. Um, if the long-term funding for the highway bill helps incent that, you know, I guess I'm all for that. I'd still like to see a more relevant, sustainable funding source specifically for the Highway Trust Fund uh, that, uh, that makes sense, perhaps uh, incenting more development of uh, federal oil and gas leases. Um, but we need to do something clearly because we cannot, as a, as a nation, and I'm speaking, of course, on behalf of the United States, we cannot continue to allow the crumbling of our, uh, of our uh, transportation, our surface transportation system, and uh, we've just got to find a way to invest. Because if we're going to be profitable, if we're going to incent the type of growth that our incredible economy can uh, can uh, invest in, we need to be able to move goods and services state to state, coast to coast, border to border, and uh, and beyond. So uh, we're, I'm committed to that, working hard on that. Obviously, there's other infrastructure demands. Uh, pipelines important, as we know. Uh, pipelines between our two countries on the uh, on the northern border have been challenging for some reason. Uh, pipelines between our state borders have been challenging for some reason, and I think it's folly. Uh, we need to move more of our, our petroleum products, whether it's refined or uh, crude. We need to move more of them uh, through pipelines. Safer, more efficient, frees up uh, space on our highways and our railroads to move other commodities. Can only move those in those uh, those uh, mediums. So uh, we just have a lot of work to do. I know you're committed to doing it, and I appreciate it so much. I want you to know more than anything that um, you know. I really view this coalition as an extension uh, of the stakeholders that, that are important to me. That you're really an extension of my own shop. Your expertise, your advocacy, uh, my access to you and yours to me is as, is as important as anything. So uh, I know you're going to have a great conference. I know Niles is coming up right after me. You're one of the smartest people I know. He, he understands some of this stuff better than anybody. We want to open markets, not just between our countries, but well beyond our countries. I think we can market those products, whether it's energy products or food products, best as a North American uh, trade uh, coalition. So let's get about the business of doing it. Uh, appreciate your, your input as always. Appreciate your attention this morning. Wish you all the very, very best there in Bismarck. I wish I could be with you maybe next time. God bless you. So maybe we could have the lights for a minute. Anybody on the light switch? Mr. Kramer mentioned pipelines, and certainly that's very important to all our economy. And uh, just uh, 
TransCanada was our, TransCanada Pipelines, or TransCanada, as they're known, they were our breakfast sponsor. And they, uh, Steve rounded them up uh, sort of late in the game and they didn't get a representative here, but uh, in our la local paper about two weeks ago, and I wasn't aware of this, that TransCanada has put in an application in both the U.S. and Canada to run a pipeline from the Williston Basin up to their east-west transmission line in Canada. And that particular line hooks into TransCanada at a place called Mooseman, which is my hometown. And they are, uh, there's a, another project going on with TransCanada. Uh, several years ago, they, because there's so much natural gas all over the world, they converted one of their 36 inch pipelines to uh, crude oil. So that's been going for several years. Now they've got what they call the TransCanada East project, which is they're gonna convert the second line to oil and from Montreal out to the Maritimes, they're gonna put new pipe in the ground. So it's gonna go from Hardesty, Alberta, there's gonna be a tank farm. The second tank farm is going at Mooseman. That tank farm is going to take uh, uh, a thousand people two years to build, and it's gonna be worth a half a billion dollars. This pipeline that is proposed from Williston to go up to the tank farm at Mooseman and then that oil will get out to the east coast. So it's sort of a reverse all the pipelines we've talked about up until now and all the controversy. It's about oil going south. This is about oil going north. And as I see the, the line, it's going to go through oil friendly territory all the way through. Because in North Dakota, I can't see anybody resisting pipelines. Once it gets into Canada, the, the Bakken formation goes right from the Canadian border right up to Mooseman. In fact, I'm the benefit of the, uh, that formation. I have some oil wells that I benefit from the royalties, so I'm very interested in it also. But uh, that, that's good news for the oil business, that uh, if TransCanada can pull that off, and I don't see the resistance uh, getting that pipeline put through, and... Uh, Hopefully by next year, when we come back to the summit, we'll have some further news on that particular uh, project. Uh, as Mr. Kramer indicated, we've got a, an expert uh, coming up, uh, Niles uh, Huska. He's the president and CEO of uh, KLJ. And uh, with no further ado, I will, okay. Sure. Another Canuck. <laughs> Welcome to the stage, sir. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm the mayor of Estevan, Saskatchewan, Canada, and I'm very happy to be here. This has been a great convention. And my counterpart from Weyburn, Rochelle, is here as well. So uh, this is our first time, but we definitely will continue uh, to come to the uh, next meetings as you have them. And uh, I'd just like to pass on an announcement that we had uh, yesterday, yesterday morning as a matter of fact. Uh, we've been lobbying for many years to twin the highway from Estevan to Regina, which is about 200 kilometers, or in U.S. terms, about uh, 130 miles. And um, yesterday, the announcement, they're going to do the first leg, from Bean Fate to Estevan. Then they'll continue on from Estevan to Regina, and then the last leg, at least right now, they're saying, will be from Bean Fate to North Portal. So over the next few years, and they haven't said, they haven't made that commitment how long the complete job will take, but uh, they're going to do it in, in stages. But uh, in a few years, we will be twinned from North Portal all the way to Regina, which has a huge transportation hub so this is excellent news for everybody concerned. So I just wanted to pass that on. Thank you. Certainly that will be great news and uh, there's been a, a lot of accidents on that particular road. A chap that I worked with for many years that lives at Milestone, Bernie Churko. I don't know if you know Bernie, but uh, that was one of his pet projects. And I know the government offered to put in passing lanes 
on that particular road and the committee stuck to their guns and they said we don't want passing lanes we want twinned highways so uh, if you keep lobbying and keep the pressure on uh, good things happen now I think Niles if you would come up here and uh, liquefied natural gas that's something that's intrigued me but I know absolutely nothing about it so uh, I'm sure I'll get a What's this, Natural Gas 101 or liquefied yes, natural? Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. And, and I'm going to start off by saying I'm not an LNG expert. And I want to thank the two people on the table over there for writing a great presentation for me. And so when they look at me and wave, it means I said something wrong. So <laughs> I'll get, do my best to uh, give you a little bit of a prep on what we think of, of LNG. Uh, and we are very bullish on LNG, its long-term impacts both to the region and to the country. Uh, there's a lot of different types of ways that LNG will be used and can be used, and I think I'll talk a little bit about those. But uh, there's been a lot of indication that, that long-haul vehicle traffic um, can depend on LNG at some point in the future. And that, of course, has some, inst has some obstacles to it, um, but we can overcome those. Um, we can certainly use um, LNG in the oil fields where it's a very high potent liquid fuel that uh, generally serves as a diesel replacement. Um, and um, there's been a lot of talk uh, with BNSF about converting some of its power, the locomotives, over to LNG. And that, of course, would be great for a number of reasons because LNG is probably the cleanest fuel we can burn. Uh, there are also some interesting new um, thoughts and conversations going on about using LNG for uh, purposes of the oil field of fracking and um, some of the other cleaning um, techniques that are necessary so that could also help and then we do a lot of remote power generation and of course LNG is a very high potential fuel so um, that should work out for us too then of course we want to always say the opposite side of it and on the opposite side of it there's some technical challenges and the technical challenges with LNG is first of all not we're not familiar with it none of us are so uh, it's going to be take some um, education and most of the, uh, the LNG facilities in the country are very, very large or in the world. So when we start talking about micro, it's uh, brand new technologies across the board. Um, there's marketing challenges because you can't market a product unless you have it and you can't have the product unless you have a market. So the challenges are, are, are there too. And then there's infrastructure challenges. How do we uh, make this product work in a system that's dependent upon petrol fuels today only? So first, what is LNG? Well, LNG is uh, just liquefied methane. And the slides show the process of what we do. We start off with raw gas. Um, the raw ga gas can, has to be consistent and has to be clean. And probably the most important characteristic of a raw gas that you're going to liquefy is that it has to be very low in, in moisture content. So um, take some pre-cleaning to strip out any of the, uh, any of the liquids, the H2Os in it and the other foreign substances so you can get a better product. Um, once that's done, um, you compress it um, and chill it. So the, um, it's a dual combination that ultimately we stabilize with, um, with chilling only. So the product has to be taken down to negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. So a very, very, very low temperature which means that it takes a lot of energy. So the biggest challenge in making LNG is, is for every degree that you move a product down, there's an equivalent amount of heat that has to be dissipated. So it's a thermodynamic process for every uh, temperature the degree one way, there's a temperature degree that's exhausted into the air. So the smaller and the larger LNGs plant, the biggest challenge is, is how do they get rid of this excess temperature that they build up when they're cooling this liquid down. So when the product is actually in the form of LNG, it's at a negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit and you can drop off all the pressures, so it's at atmospheric pressure. And that's a big difference, for instance, in propane. So propane, what we do with it is we compress it up to about two, you know, into the uh, high as a thousand um, in some of our uh, major facilities and we hold it with compression. With LNG, we hold the product stable with temperature which gives us some challenges. And the first and most important challenges is, uh, would be storage and shipping. And we'll talk a little bit about those because it has to stay at the right temperature or it uh, vaporizes off the top. Okay, once you get it to whatever location you're going to deploy the fuel, you've got the reverse process that has to occur. So you don't really burn LNG. 
you reconstitute the LNG through a warming process and you regasify it, you turn it back into methane and you use it as a methane product just like we do with natural gas out of the taps at all of our houses. So, so it's a, again, it's a process that requires energy on both ends, um, energy to um, chill it and energy to reheat as we go forward. So today in the world, LNG is not very well known or even well used in the United States or Canada. And the reason is, is because we have large fixed base natural gas facilities on both of our continents and it's easier for us to compress it and ship it. So when we ship natural gas in a pipeline, uh, we don't chill it, we simply compress it. So um, when we make LNG, we can reduce the size of a BTU from down by one six hundredth of a uh, factor of one to six hundred. So whatever size it is today, we reduce it down by chilling. You get 600 parts per million in the same uh, space we got at the rest. In the States when we ship and in Canada when we ship, we simply compress it. Um, don't chill it and we can move it just as well. Um, but it's not suitable in compression form because we can only compress it to about one one hundredth. So it's six times greater to um, shrink it with temperature than it is to shrink it with compression. So the largest players in the world are players that uh, deal in the LNG markets uh, globally and they ship this product to areas with no, uh, no energy at all. So in the United States, you can see there are some that are moving into it, but those are our new entrants and we'll look at that a little further down the line here. So Royal Dutch Shell just purchased um, British gas for $70 billion, which was one of the largest purchasers of, um, of this type of a product commodity in many, many, many years. So Royal Dutch is putting all of, its, uh, all of its energy into the one commodity, which is LNG. And why is that? Because if you're in the market, it's a very, very, very lucrative market. In fact, in the United States, um, when um, LNG was selling for $1.75 to $1.90 a gallon, it was selling uh, into the Singapore markets and in the Far East for $12 to $17 per gallon. So there's a significant amount of upside to the product. The other part about the LNG markets that's unique is, is that in order to have the uh, two processes, the chilling and then the um, reconstituting occur, there's a lot of capital that's spent. These plants are very, very, very expensive and in order to make these capital expenditures, people have to have long-term commitments. So generally, LNG is bought and sold um, on 10 to 20 year windows. So the contracts are very, very, very long and the contracts are very, very high priced to make it work. But if you're Singapore or Japan and you have no other options, uh, having a stable supply of LNG is very, very, very important for you. So these are the major players, both um, in the United States and worldwide. And I'll talk a little bit about the different um, sides for what happens. In the United States, right now, uh, I'll start back by saying that uh, five years ago, uh, the United States, all these, many of these plants, many of these exact locations, exact plant sites, were being permitted for the reconstitution of LNG, for taking liquid LNG and converting it back into natural gas and feeding it into the system. And when um, the shale plays began coming on board, like the Bakken shales and the Marcellus and uh, out in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, all of these plants began switching their processes. So they went from, okay, we now have to do a reconstitution, a reheat plant, to, oh, well, let's get ready to export this product. So all these sites now that are shown, which were um, shipping locations to take uh, liquid natural gas off of the uh, oceans and push it into the U.S. markets are now being converted over for export. Now, on the opposite end of that, every one of these is in the queue to uh, get an export license uh, so that they can export LNG into the markets and that's uh, not going so well. Um, there was a, a step made last year by President Obama when he allowed the export of NGLs, which is natural gas liquids, which everybody in this industry felt was a very positive move because an NG the NGLs are very close to LNGs and if we have too many NGLs, we have too many LNGs. So these plants are all um, look, are being planned to, uh, for export purposes. Today, they can export, but only to the United States and Canada uh, and the other NAFTA partners. So that's as far as our LNG can go into the global markets. So these are the breakdowns of the plants. 
And if you take a look at those numbers, you can see how huge they are. Um, each one of these is a, how many um, billion cubic feet of gas is processed on a daily basis. And the key to this, for, for me, to, as a recognition of what's, why this is so challenging for us, is, is that in the Bakken today, we only produce 1.2 billion cubic feet of gas per day. So there isn't enough gas being produced in the Bakken today to feed um, any one of these plants, with the exception of Cove Point and uh, Jordan Cove. So uh, we, you need significantly more potential. So these plants are all located in gas hubs, and they're at, located at gas hubs because then they can have access to multiple markets, and if one market slows, the other market can pick up. So they have the availability of consistent flow to, the, to their plants. If you um, look at the total amount of energy being exported, it's very, very, very significant. And I'll start breaking it down into energy equivalents based on diesel fuel so you can see the numbers and how they convert over. So right now, uh, significant numbers are under construction. And since there is no global markets or in, in no U.S. markets for LNG, there looks to be upwards of um, 10 to uh, 12 uh, a billion cubic feet of available fuel that will be coming onto the markets fairly soon. So these could be diverted in easily into transportation fuels or diverted into some other product that can be burned domestically or within the NAFTA countries. So the product will come online very quickly once these plants are up and running. The uh, most important takeaway from what we just talked about is the fact that these are all mega plants. And not only are they large mega plants, they're also located next to ports. So why are they, why is that? Um, it's mostly because it's very difficult to move those products. So um, unlike uh, a, um, the other things we talked about that we can pipe, we can compress natural gas and move it the way we do today in pipe like, pipelines like the northern border or in a number of them that I'll show you as we go along. But just as importantly, um, we can't move it in pipelines. So the product is basically fixed by location unless you can put it on an ocean cruiser. And even when it's on an ocean cruiser, you have some limitations with regards to how you can keep it chilled. So um, a lot of people would look and say, why don't we move it on rail? Well, we can't move it on rail because we can't keep those cars chilled temperature-wise enough so that we can prevent the product from vaporizing out. So the traditional distribution markets suggest strongly that we need um, very large scale production plants and that's uh, again at very large and very reliable supplies of the fuel. So Bakken gas, so we look at what's going on today in the Bakken and this is the Bakken field unified and what it says is that we produce 1.2 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. Um, that number seems to be relatively stable based on production. So it's very interesting too to note that we produce about 1.2 billion barrels of oil per day. So the numbers look to be relatively equivalent and that seems to be what's coming out of the well uh, on a ratio. Um, so, the, so as our flows would increase in the Bakken, so would our flows increase with gas. The, the gas flows actually drop off faster than the oil flows as the pressurization of the field occurs. So there will be f the, the uh, curves with, for depletion are stronger in natural gas than they are in the Bakken anyways, than they are for the, um, the oil fuel itself. So right now, 81% um, of it's captured and sold, and that, that doesn't mean that that can't be available for um, LNG, but right now it's captured and it's sold and it's pushed into pipelines. So it's being distributed throughout the United States. And when a product is in the pipeline network, there are most likely long-term takeoff contracts for it. So the possibility that it can become available for LNG are rather limited. 14% um, of it is, is actually paid for but not used. So those are contracts with the producers have with them. Um, the, with the landowners where its product is bought but it's really not uh, used for anything other than flaring. And then the last part is the part that we believe is available for um, LNG production in, in North Dakota and Montana in the Bakken regions. And the m significant difference with the Bakken gas from many other gas fields is that it's a wet gas and that presents lots of challenges for us in, in its usage. 
And I mean, the only thing we can use for um, LNG is methane. So in order to get a very pure grade methane, meaning everything stripped out of it that's possible to keep it stable, um, we have to remove um, over 50% of the product. And you can see that, uh, what the products are. And when uh, in the industry we refer to NGLs, natural gas liquids, that's everything below methane. So we have ethane, propane, all the other anes, plus some nitrogen. Um, and then uh, the other is generally um, water and other chemicals that are in there. So I think the, the key for uh, Bakken production of LNG is, is that 50% of the product that comes off the production units will not be LNG, it'll be NGLs, so natural gas liquids, which have good value with the exception of the ethane. And the ethane has uh, today n little or no value in the Bakken because there's no place to put it. And so there's a lot of flaring of ethane that occurs because um, currently it can't be moved. Um, ethane is a very, very, very unstable product, and if you attempt to ship it in the wrong conditions, it just explodes. So nobody wants to deal with the product and clean it up because the ethane markets are actually negative. So if you have a, ethane, um, cub a cubic foot of ethane gas today, you have to pay to get rid of it. Now those markets shift as, a, as the product um, usages go around, but today it's a negative commodity. So what do you do with the ethane? Um, that's a bigger challenge and a, and a challenge that we need to tackle in North Dakota, and that is you have to crack it. And cracking it means that we rearrange the molecules and we restructure the carbon. So you separate out the carbon, you restructure it into a molecule that can be used, and what we do with it in crackers is make polyethylene. And polyethylene is the product that is used in PVC pipe, or PE, polyethylene pipe, so plastic pipes. It's also used for other plastic commodities. It's a great product if you have a use for it and if you can get it to market. North Dakota's problem there is, is that it, getting it to market would compete with every other rail user, and the railroads are, are overloaded today and overburdened, so we really don't see um, the ability to move that quickly. Now, there are a couple of uh, plants being proposed um, in the region for cracking ethylene, and uh, hopefully those go forward because the product today is being generally wasted, um, and it's not a very good thing. So, now let's focus on the 5% of the unsold gas and just give you some numbers to keep in mind as we look at the conversions. So, 5% uh, unsold gas results in about uh, 383,000 gallons of LNG. And that uh, conversion ratio is again a 600 to 1. So we chill it down to, to, to reduce its volume by 600 um, times, and that's what you end up with. That means that um, if all the gas in the Bakken, and the whole 1.2 million barrel or 1.2 billion cubic feet of gas were converted to LNG out of the Bakken, it would be about 15.3 million gallons of LNG um, per day that could be used if that was what we decided to uh, do with that particular gas. So um, the other ratio that I'll and we'll come back to this. I just want to throw it out. The ratio is is that it takes in an energy equivalent basis, it takes 1.7 gallons of LNG to equal one gallon of diesel. And that's an energy equivalent. Uh, it's total number of BTUs on the product basis. So the conversion, easy conversion is two, and you're not far off. So we've looked at a number of uh, micro LNG units that are being proposed in the Bakken and other fields, and they're all brand new. Um, these products have not been producing. There are um, some of these products that are producing overseas on an experimental basis, but they generally have not had any use in the world, and therefore companies have generally not um, deployed on them. And basically what these are are great, great, great big refrigerator units that chill. And again, the biggest issue we have with the chilling is how do you dissipate the heat? So in the wintertime, it's not a problem up here. We just um, dissipate the heat with, with um, air, low volume air movements. But in the summertime, when we get into the 80s and 90s, uh, it becomes very difficult to dissipate all of that heat in these small units. Um, the big units use um, liquid cooling 
and they use um, uh, other uh, rapid accelerated methods of moving the heat off the compressor or off the chilling units into a waste source that is then um, basically atmospherically released. So the size of the, these plants that we're seeing are generally um, in that, that range that we're talking up there. They're producing um, gallons, total gallon numbers that are fairly low um, using um, local gas. And in the Bakken, uh, and in any field, but especially the Bakken, the flows of gas coming out of a well are inconsistent. So what we, what, when you produce uh, crude out of these wells, you get three products. You get um, oil, um, water, and r liquid rich natural gas. So each of these products, the water, the oil, and the LNG, r liquid rich natural gas varies as the flows come out of the hole. So in any given day, um, your, your gas content will go up and down, as will your oil and your water will stay relatively consistent. So in order to make a plant work, we need to tie a number of wells together. So um, on um, some of the newer pads uh, and any of the hot spots in the Bakken, this isn't an issue because uh, finding a pad with eight wells on it isn't a problem at all. In fact, a lot of the pads that are now going into the Bakken in the, in the heavy um, areas of production will have 15 to 25 uh, pads or wells on a single pad. So that makes this work much better. But in the areas that are being flared, that's generally not the case. The reason that the gas is being flared in these areas is because the wells are relatively low productivity, they're very, very remote, and therefore um, difficult to get pipe to. And so if the volumes are too low and they're separated by great distances, installing pipe to eight wells to bring in enough capacity for a single small 5,000 gallon plant could cost you as much as the plant. So we generally say gathering is about a million dollars a mile, um, and um, it's less than that, but it all depends upon where you're at based in, in landowner prices per rod for right-of-way, um, which is getting to be an issue. And I do disagree with, with um, Congressman Kramer, and in fact, he, that was ironic because we were on the plane together on Monday. I seem to sit next to him a lot since I travel a lot. But we were debating this, and um, in North Dakota, getting a pipeline through is becoming extremely difficult. And it's because there's more landowner resistance in North Dakota today than there is in a lot of states around us. And a recent move by a major company has tainted it even further, and that is that Energy Transfer Partners elected to condemn the entire route without any landowner contact, and that was a huge hit to our industry because now landowners are um, becoming even more inflamed that um, they weren't even contacted and simply received a letter in the mail that said we were taking your right of way. Um, so it's those types of moves that make pipeline building in states that are very energy and oil sensitive very, very difficult. So, um, so we're up against a lot of challenges with regards to that. So, so these plants, a 5,000 uh, gallon a day plant will cost you about 5 million, maybe 6 million, but the gathering system will cost you 5 million, maybe 6 million. So you're doubling your cost. Generally speaking, um, all producers want their product picked up and pushed into the pipeline because they'll get more for it. So you can't even be sure how long you'll be able to use these gathering systems before they're picked up by another company and you've got to move your plant further along. The other thing about these plants is, is that, again, you're looking at huge refrigeration units, so their power demands are ex very, very, very high. So we're talking about placing one megawatt loads on well pads that don't have the capacity to um, push one megawatt power through it because there will be multiple wells on a site. So it's got the challenges for these small plants are, are pretty high. Um, when we looked at the product, remember we said there's 48% methane and there's 52% of other stuff? Well, we have to strip the, actually when you chill it, the other stuff comes out. So there's a stream of byproduct that comes off, that's the NGL stream, and that NGL stream needs to be moved off to site too. Um, today, um, because of a lot of factors, NGLs are running negative also. So you can't sell them into the market because there's, an, there's enough coming off the gas plants. So the NGL markets are very low uh, in the commodity price range. So 
Um, we think that there's a lot of challenges in the Bakken, especially available because of the product that's there, but most importantly because of the fact that there's no market. And we'll talk a little bit about the market and with the we and we've looked at this in a, in a very uh, many ways to try to figure out how you do it, because you can't get um, people to convert their fleets over or begin to become dependent on LNG unless you have LNG, and you can't um, have LNG unless you have somebody to use it. So the only way to create the markets is to begin to ship the product in from some other location. The closest location that we would have to ship the product in today is out of Minneapolis, which drives the price of it up high enough that it can't compete with diesel fuel. So it's difficult to create the market in today's conditions. So it's a catch-22 on LNG today. But when these other plants come on board, we should have a, a, very, very, a better ability to make this work. So how do you create the market? Um, first of all, you've got to find the users. And we list a number of users, and I'll just touch on them. Uh, generally speaking, LNG is probably best fit today for fleets of trucks that make a circuit. Um, and they can fill up their LNG in a single LNG plant and come around to use the fuel. You can generally hold on upwards of 800 gallon or 800 miles of fuel in a conversion unit, so they could uh, spend a day or two on the road dropping off their commodities and refill. And the reason is we don't have um, LNG stations. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward with what, what I think would drive transportation in your corridor. Um, oil and gas companies are very interested in it, and why is that? Because it's a very, very high potential fuel and it's available, and it gives them a competitive advantage over diesel fuel. And there's some also some, some investigations looking at whether LNG with that extremely low temperature could be used for um, fracking formations in the same way that CO2 is, because if you push a CO2 is the same product, it's just compressed and brought down in temperature. So when you release a product like LNG into an atmosphere, an environment in the bottom of a hole that's at 260 degrees, you have a 500 degree temperature differential, which means you have a heck of a lot of energy that has to be dissipated. So if they can control that energy in the hole, it's, it makes for a great fracking product. Uh, coal industry, and we say coal industry because it's the same thing, burns a heck of a lot of fuel, and all the trucks come home at night to the same place to fill up. Um, so it's a good uh, product for it. Uh, railroads, same thing. Um, the product we can keep stable in the tanker cars for seven to nine days, which means that a tanker car, uh, a locomotive set, pulling one or two LNG um, so fuel sources should be able to make its entire route, drop its fuel, drop its um, uh, oil off, and come back and reload in the Bakken, which I believe is the model that BNSF is actually looking at. BNSF has a number of LNG locomotives that are being added to their fleet. We just don't know where they'll deploy. Great possibility for communities, and in the community standpoint, it means we have a lot of cities in North Dakota and across the country that um, don't have availability of natural gas, uh, and that is because there's no pipelines nearby. In the case of LNG, if you have a ready supply of LNG, you can move it over in tankers reconstitute it right at the gateway to any single community and then push it through pipes and feed homes. A great source of reliable fuel that um, um, if deployed could be as competitive as natural gas. Um, electric generation, and we say specifically microgrids, small generation facilities that are in the field. Uh, again, mostly because LNG is a much more stable fuel than diesel fuel. And um, when it's deployed, it doesn't have issues with cold start. Um, or um, any other issues with temperature, so the product works good for stranded um, locations. And then uh, current natural gas users actually could be could switch to, to subsidizing it. And, and in case of a city like Bismarck Man, then that might have a shortage of of uh, capacity to feed natural gas, rather than adding a huge pipeline, they could simply subsidize during the peak seasons with LNG which is a much more uh, better use of the piping systems that we have in place today. So it could shave the peak off all of our LNG, or all of our natural gas facilities if it was available. So, um, we looked at some of those numbers, but these numbers even get scarier. So we, if we look at a unit train, in order to fill a unit train up, we need 3.41 million uh, gallons of, uh, of LNG. Those plants are producing 5,000 gallons a day, 
Um, and uh, just a single car with one plant takes six plants producing every day. Uh, the temperatures back down to 260 degrees, uh, negative, has to stay there. The cars are insulated, but they're not chilled. Uh, they can't be chilled because we don't have the capacity of power available to feed each of those individual cars. So simply to fill a unit train um, using all of North Dakota's crude would take two and a half days, uh, but that's never going to happen. So if you can look at the percentages and see, shipping with unit trains seem to be impossible. So now you're starting to look at introducing your product into a different market. In the unit train market, you can have your product ready to go, um, have it picked up, and it'll go nonstop to its destination. So moving LNG to a market, even on the coasts, would mean that three to four days in, the product would be on the coast and could be offloaded. There's about nine days from the time when you make it to the time when the product loses so much temperature that it begins to vaporize off in the car and that's a bad situation because when it vaporizes off it pressurizes the car and makes for um, an explosive situation. So initially it doesn't look like the Bakken can power using uh, um, rail can have any effects with the, or can use LNG for anything. So what are we faced with and what are the challenges and what are the obstacles that we have? Well first off um, we have uh, the challenge of trying to use these small plants. And I do think that uh, the, there are a number of small plants coming online. And there are a number of them that are being deployed all across the world. And when those small plants come online, they'll have some very significant advantages. And I'll look at a small plant and say that on the, your corridor, um, we're guessing that five to seven small plants along the entire length of the U.S would make for a supply chain that would work for the large, uh, large vehicles hauling heavy loads. Uh, if they're small, these small plants come online and become competitive, which they will over time, um, you could simply park a small plant at any gas hub and get the gas out of it that you need to make these things work. So you could be, uh, there could be a series of these spaced um, four to 700 miles apart and each one of them would become, could constitute their own LNG, and then that LNG could become a fuel product line making shipping in the corridor much more effective and efficient. So when fuels were at their normal condition, the fuel, diesel fuel selling in the neighborhood of uh, three to four bucks, and uh, LNG selling in the neighborhood of a dollar sixty to a dollar seventy, um, and lower at times, there was about a 67% differential. And that's the differential that most of these small plants were modeled at. So if you can save in round number 70 cents, you're doing pretty good. Now the um, conversions of tractors, uh, for the truck tractors, is about thirty to $40,000. Um, the major companies now have full warranties on these conversions. And so you can um, use, put the conversions on and Caterpillar will warranty your truck. So that's the conversion price. And if you buy them new, it's forty to $50,000. When prices for fuels were the way they were in the past um, three years, um, these payoffs on these fleets would be in the neighborhood of six months or less. So th there, there was a very good payoff. Now today that's not the case because diesel fuels selling um, well below the price of 1.7 gallons of LNG. So it's all market dependent um, and getting into the market is going to be tough. And we still think the biggest long-term variable is how do you get a market established and that's again all dependent upon the price of diesel fuel and if diesel fuel prices go to where they are there'll be a number of people who will get into the markets and establish it. You have to have a dependable source of LNG and it has to be a pure clean source of LNG because if you're uh, working with a product that's not completely cleaned up and there's too much moisture in it, you're going to have trouble with your engines. Um, and uh, we also believe strongly that um, North Dakota will become an LNG producer and that there will be fuels available and where they're burned and how they're burned is the only challenge that we think that we face today. And that's about as much as I know about LNG. Any questions?
Does anybody have any questions uh, for Niles? Yep. Mine's more on the dissipation of the heat and uh, the uses of that and how you could sell it to the communities around you, like uh, the central heating systems in the old former Soviet Union and how we could maximize the use of that in apartment buildings and, uh, and uh, warehouses and stuff like that that need the heat units and uh, what kind of value you could add up the chain with something like that. Well, it's significant heat, so you could add significant value. And that's, again, why the industry is placing so much uh, emphasis on getting efficient micro units. Because if they can be get efficient micro units, they can begin placing them in strategic locations. And then you can design uh, facilities around it for waste heat. So, I mean, again, when we start looking at these temperature differentials and, and thinking that we can, uh, we're talking about uh, at times, changing the temperature differential by 360 degrees, that's a, an awful lot of steam that could be produced out of these micro plants. Um, and then as the plant sizes go up, they could begin to do a lot. So, so those are the models that need to be deployed. So right now, even in the oil fields, they have significant benefits if it can be deployed. So one of the things that we looked at when we modeled our systems was is that we need hot water in the oil field for paraffin removal. So all the workover rigs need hot water. And in the wintertime, you need hot water for lots of things, not only for cleaning and paraffin for removal, but for just keeping facilities running. So there is a good potential for waste heat reuse as long as you had water available. And in our case in the Bakken, rarely do we have the availability of water and uh, excess gas capacity, but if those two could be combined, which th there are certain locations that that has potential in the fields also. Niles, we're developing a, a 150 megawatt um, combined cycle natural gas power plant in Butte, Montana. Our team is, and um, one of the issues that we're facing there is intermittent supply of natural gas with Northwestern Energy. It's pretty much through the whole system. MDU has a similar situation here. They have a lot of supply in the summertime, but not a lot in the winter months. So we have to, is there, is there feasibility of potentially on a fixed plant like that, putting in a um, LNG, you know, and storing um, some of this material so that um, we could be an intermittent supply producer um, versus a firm and, and then using some of the waste heat for the combined cycle. Um, have you guys done any kind of uh, uh, engineering on that? We've uh, worked on feasibility studies for a number of customers that are doing just what you're talking about. And actually it's a, a very good uh, way of uh, subsidizing natural gas for, uh, f for on your side, two sides, for Northwest Energy because for, in order for them to reinforce their infrastructure to get adequate gas to your 150 megawatt plant is a lot of infrastructure. Whereas um, simply having access to LNG in the peak periods for Northwest system is much, uh, much less expensive. And the, the issue becomes is that LNG doesn't store well and to keep its temperature down at negative 260 is, is cost prohibitive. So you'd be buying your product um, during the periods that you need it, which isn't an issue because it can be, it can be shipped and again kept stable for uh, at least nine to ten days uh, under normal conditions. And then in, in your case, when you get it on site, you, could, you can put it into containers that have a lot more insulation than trucks. So your storage time could be in the neighborhood of 30 days um, easily. So you'd be able to uh, get ready for now, uh, those peaks that are coming, since Northwest has got a pretty darn good idea when they happen each year, and, and have the LNG start. So it's a very good solution. And when you weigh it against some of the other solutions that are available, it's, it's very uh, much is a, a, has favorable cost implications um, and allows you to do what you want to do. And actually, there are times during the year when um, on an energy basis, LNG uh, it has less cost per BTU than natural gas does. 
and that all depends upon the commodity as it's moving through and where you're getting it um, from. So you, you'd actually be able to have a dual fuel system in, in reality and, com and you'd be able to offer your, pr you'd be able to use the product when you wanted to, uh, to shave cost off your power production. Anybody else? Flaring of gas seems to be a tremendous waste and uh, there's a refinery in Regina and any one time when you go by there, there's probably five or six or seven stacks with a flame in the air. They're a tremendous user of electricity and I'm not that smart, but uh, putting that flame or gas fired uh, generators back into the uh, system, same thing in the oil field, you've got pump jacks using electric motors and then you've got a flare right beside it. And why can't they use that energy to generate electricity? Okay, so I'll, there are two different conditions, but we'll go to both of them. So in the gas processing plants and in the refineries, generally what's flared are products that you have to get rid of. And so actually in the refineries and the gas processing plants, a certain portion of either methane or uh, some propane is, is vented into the stack to keep the flame going so that you can push into it um, undesirable materials. And so at, at the gas plants that we see out of the Bakken, what's burning is the ethane because they oftentimes can't stabilize the ethane, but they're also burning off some of the compounds that they can't stabilize and can't use or have no markets for. So that's the reason that they're doing it. So it's actually a net, uh, it's an energy consumer for them also, but it beats any other alternate that's available today for getting rid of the products that are undesirable. And there are uh, a lot of those that come out of the processing, uh, that 2% that, that, uh, that we show of the NGLs that come out, a lot of that is undesirable material that has to be burned off. Now on, on the sites today, what we find is, is that there's a gas supply, but we can't condition it properly. And so the, there's a number of uh, groups right now trying to figure out how to take that gas that's being flared and converted over into a fuel that can be used to, to run generators. And they're getting closer, but the issue generally in the Bakken is, is that it's wet gas again. So the first thing you have to do is that you have to remove the 52% of the materials that are just unstable uh, in order to get your BTU content consistent with what the engine can handle. And so what they find is, is that um, in, at these sites, in order to condition the gas, it costs them more than um, it costs to bring the power in, which is a big issue. And even if there's no power, uh, the, it's very difficult to remove the NGLs because the flows are inconsistent. So sometimes you get an NGL ratio that's higher or lower and the filtration systems don't filter it out right. And what generally happens is if the filtration systems don't filter out these NGLs correctly, ethane leaks by because it's the easiest, com hardest compound to capture and the easiest compound to leak by on collection systems. And when ethane leaks by and your ethane content increases and it goes in mixes with the methane and that fuel goes into a uh, diesel converted engine, a diesel engine that's, uh, that's on a gen set to make power, uh, the ethane pre-ignites and shatters the cylinders because it has such a high uh, energy content and because it's so unstable. So unlike what's supposed to occur in a diesel engine, which is the piston's supposed to come to the top and put just enough pressure on the diesel to ignite it, or push come to the top and put enough pressure on to ignite the, the uh, natural gas, the piston comes three quarters of the way up, it ignites and the piston's still on the way up and the power's on the way down. So, and that's all because of the ethane. So they're trying, there's a number of systems that are, are working now, starting to work in the industry to eliminate that pre-ignition crisis so that we don't have to deal with it to make the power more stable. So I think you'll start to see those being deployed on sites faster. Uh, or now actually being deployed on sites. But um, on your gas plants, they'll always be flaring. Bad stuff. 
So, and very regulated, bad stuff, but <laughs> you need the flare. I, I uh, find it curious because we have all this waste heat in a very cold country. <laughs> yeah. In the winter, anyway. Yes. Uh, th there's a couple issues that I've been looking at for a little while, and basically it's the process of, uh, uh, we believe there's a process where you can take CO2, for example, and convert it into a very clean jet fuel. There's two things you need. You need CO2 and a fair bit of heat, lots of heat capture. Uh, those are the two processes the, the, of the, the bulk of what you need to do this. And so I would see these working together with uh, coal-fired power plants, for example. That example is Estevan, where they have the uh, carbon capture plant. Uh, if you did that, you'd have excess heat from a thermal power plant, but that may not be enough or hot enough and so on. So that's where you would set up a process where you wanted to uh, get rid of excess heat from other processes. You'd want to tie it into something like that. Yeah, that would be fantastic. So as soon as you finish that process, we can deploy them all over. So there, uh -huh. there are so much CO2 available up here and so much extra gas to make the heat that... Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the premise is basically uh, uh, starts back when you talk about uh, uh, how do you use the fisher trot process to produce any kind of built fuel? And the answer is you, you are going to make uh, uh, syngas. What is syngas? HCO. Mm -hmm. Now, we can take uh, natural gas, methane, other kind of products, break it down to make that, but that's the most expensive process in in, in any uh, build-up for uh, a fuel in the future, like, you know, your uh, uh, fisher trop or any of those ones, eh? That's the expensive process. So we, we believe we can take and combine the CO2 uh, to make HCO uh, using a particular uh, nanocatalyst process. And if we can do, and, and from what we understand is you can do that fairly uh, about half the cost as you would trying to convert natural gas to make a fuel. And so we're working on that process now, and uh, we're kind of looking for, well, we've got, we've got one source of CO2 if we really needed it, <laughs> already being produced. Uh, but we see that happening in a lot of coal-fired power plants in the future. And so I guess my question is, uh, would this methane, or, or I mean, or this ethane that's so volatile should be able to be broken down into HCO as well? Uh, I'm not sure what the process would be. I'd have to check some more, but uh, but maybe that's the issue we can make of that side of the product too. It's a great product. It has a, a lot of carbon molecules that are available on a, a much, uh, probably a dense, four times the density of CO2. So right. if, if the yeah. process should definitely work, um, and again, we've got the product here. They're, yes, they're separating that. it off in the gas plants, yeah. on all the plants, and yeah. several of the plants are stabilizing it enough to ship, but not many. So no. it, it's a great byproduct. And yeah. would the, the process we look at is that we started from the other end. You want a clean, or a clean jet fuel that has very low particulates and very low um, ar aromatic hydrocarbons, your benzenes. Those are the two processes that make jet fuel fairly dirty <laughs> and we, are, we actually put that stuff at 35,000 feet <laughs> mm. probably not a good place to put it either yeah, not and we think we can reduce those fact by a factor of at least 10 and if we can we can uh, clean up the air quite a bit more too and you okay. can come right here and get some methane <laughs> that sounds good yeah right. okay. thank you <laughs> one more Steve Else. Um, one thing you keep on hearing about ethane and how it's difficult to move. Now they're talking about these plastics. Uh, they were announced this plastics operation, uh, manufacturing operation in the state of North Dakota. And that was going to be using ethane. How are we going to move that from the wells to the location where the manufacturing plant would be itself? And I know MDU has got his tied to this in some fashion too, I believe. But 
do you know how that's going to be possible to move that ethane uh, so that it's not so combustible to some place and are unstable, or unstable, I should say, to, to a manufacturing process? Well, we can stabilize it far enough to move it. It just costs money. So today, if it's, if it's, if it's not yielding any return, no, one's worth, no one believes it's worth the, sta the, the stabilization process. And the stabilization process just means that you have to remove all H2O from the ethane in order to make it move. Now, you can make, we make ethane move today in all the gathering systems because it's combined with the other products. And so when it's in, this, with this, in a state of combination with some other product, specifically methane, you can move the two. So if you put ethane in with methane and you boost the content up um, to the right ratios and you push it to a, a site, then you can strip the methane, strip the ethane out push the methane back in the pipe and you've got a great way of moving the product. So that's the easiest way and on any of these crackers you need both, you need the methane for the heat and you need the ethane for the product. So as long as, and that would seem to me to be the route that we would move it if we were asked to get the product to the plant. So then you combine two efforts. Uh, and it, and, it, and at the technologies for stripping the ethane out at the ethane cracker site are, are relatively simple and easy. So that's the way they'll begin to move it over time. Now if it's, the reason that that's not done today in, in most of the facilities is because the only outlets that we have are outlets that are, are northern border pipeline which requires pipeline grade gas. So introducing ethane into that pipeline grade gas, you can put a little bit in it and still meet the standard but not a lot. So they're blending it to exactly the pipeline grade and shipping and, and then therefore we don't have many options for ethane. Now the Alliance pipeline is an NGL wet gas pipeline with ethane in it. So they have the capacity if they feel like it to boost the ethane content on that line too and ship because it's got the other, in, other items in it which makes it stable. So. There's enough, this, the ethane plants are like LNG plants and it's all about scale. And if they're scaled too small, you can't compete with the large facilities because they can make the product so much more efficiently because you still need all of these components that are very, very, very expensive. There's the second thing about an ethane cracker is, is that the, there hasn't, they've not been scaled down and to a, to a point where they could become reasonable, they could become effective at a smaller scale. And in order to scale a plant down, it becomes very expensive and complicated. So North Dakota has the potential for one or maybe two ethane plants at a reasonable scale um, with the amount of product that's available in state. Niles, I just have one question too. You know, the volume of oil on a well uh, depletes at an amount of time. So does the natural gas. What can you give us kind of an idea of how much, you know, that production goes down over a period of, of time? Because you have to take that into consideration, too, because you're not going to have that same volume of gas starting off, right? It, yes. The um, Bakken depletion curves, depending upon the region that they're produced in and whether they're, um, what the field pressurization is, uh, the, the field will deplete to 30% of the total production within an 18 month period. So if it produces 1,000 barrels per day uh, on the initial production, and, it, and it's not, it's, it's 1,000 barrels of energy equivalent, so it's taking into consideration the oil, the gas, and the NGLs, it'll deplete down over 18 months to less than 300 barrels per day. And then over the next 12 months, it could deplete as much as half of that down to 15% of the production. So in a period of less than two and a half to three years, that well will be producing 150 barrels a day maximum um, from the formation. Now, those statistics are changing rapidly as the new methods come on board and operations are changing, but that's today's depletion curves. And, then, and as the ratios of oil to gas change also, so the depletion of gases seems to be faster than the depletion of oil out of a formation. Go ahead. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot. And Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Niles. Now we're all experts in uh, LNG, so we can vote and tell the rest of the world how it all works. Uh, something that isn't in your program is the next speaker. Uh, Kerry Knudsen is the Vice President of the Bismarck State College Nas National Energy Centre for Excellence. After spending 17 years working in the en energy industry for Conoco and MDU, MDU Resources, she joined BSC in 2007. Kerry is also responsible for the Great Plains Energy Corridor at the Bismarck State College. Kerry has a Bachelor's uh, of Business Administration from the University of Oklahoma and a Master's in Business Administration from the University of Mary. So please help me welcome Kerry to the podium. Good morning. If you want to get a cup of coffee, feel free. It's going to take me about a minute to get set up here. Well, good morning. I guess we'll wait for maybe another minute. Usually a coffee break should be one or two minutes, and then it turns into five or ten, right? <laughs> Everybody likes to socialize. <laughs> That's true. They may need uh, heavy coffee before they get through this one. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm not a transportation expert, but I have driven on the whole corridor on 83 from Canada to, to McAllen, Texas. Um, not at the same time, uh, the whole trip at one time, but I did go from the northern part of South Dakota all the way to McAllen, Texas, when I was in about sixth grade. Uh, my grandparents were um, smart people. They were winter Texans. Um, instead of living in South Dakota in the winter, they headed south. So we did make a trip as a family, and it was a great, great experience, great trip, but the next time we flew. So I think my dad had had enough of four kids, um, you know, fighting in the back seat. <laughs> Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, just a very quick overview of Bismarck State College. I know some of you are very familiar with BSC. I know we've got alum distinguished alumni here uh, as well. But um, we are located right here on campus. Uh, you can see the large campus that we have. We're the third largest college in North Dakota. University of North Dakota and NDSU are the, the, the top two. Uh, but BSC has about 4,000 students, and about half the students are technical. Half of them would be uh, taking their generals and, and planning to transfer on. Uh, but we've had a lot of growth in, in the college. I need to make some updates. We have a new uh, arts, communications, and creative arts center right here. Uh, we have new dorms going in right down in this area. Uh, so we've got a lot of construction and continued growth um, of the campus. Uh, we were started in 1939 and uh, have definitely grown to, to have what we have today. In this facility, we moved in in July of 2008. You can see it's over 100,000 square feet. Uh, we've got all of our energy programs housed here, with the exception of our line worker program, which is in Mandan, and our mechanical maintenance, which is in Mandan. Uh, so we've got a lot of energy programs. I'll quickly go through those in a minute. But the facility was funded from government, uh, from the federal level, state level, uh, certainly local level, City of Bismarck, City of Mandan, and then we had a lot of funding and support from our energy industry partners. Uh, so really it took everybody coming together to be able to build this facility. Now, it's very energy efficient. We have state-of-the-art labs. Uh, we've been fortunate to have been able to get several different grants over the years to be able to add equipment and capacity, uh, and those are all in, in this facility. Uh, we want to be the worldwide leader in energy education, and I'll show you a map in a little bit where we do have students, in some cases um, outside of the U.S. and definitely in Canada, uh, but we really want to be the, the main, the top energy provider of education in the, for sure in the country and, um, and someday you know, being more of a global player. We started in 1970 with our line worker program in Mandan. Uh, and definitely were set up to support the utility industry and the coal-fired uh, plants in North Dakota. But you can see throughout time, we've added a lot of different programs. We're up to, I think, 12 now. Uh, but, you know, really early days were, were started with, uh, with the utility industry. Uh, we started the power program in 1976, and I think it started actually in a garage over in Mandan, very modest uh, facility. 
and just started with getting some pumps and valves and different equipment uh, for the students to be able to work on. Uh, and then we'll see what we've grown into today. So we've definitely had uh, great support to be able to evolve into what we're doing. Uh, we've added the process program in 82, and that covers uh, training students to become operators in refineries or petrochemical, or it could be plastics manufacturing, ethanol, things like that. So we've had that program in place, and if the, the uh, plastics facility with Badlands ever is built, uh, we, we definitely would have graduates that would be qualified to to be able to work in that facility. Uh, we've got a lot of transmission and distribution uh, related programs. We have nuclear. Uh, we are the only college in the country that has an online, an approved online nuclear program, um, approved through the Nuclear Energy Institute. And that's kind of unique. We don't have nuclear in North Dakota, but we work with utilities across the country and they do have a lot of nuclear. So they'd asked us to build this program. Uh, as I mentioned, we have mechanical maintenance, instrumentation and control, uh, we moved into renewables, and we also have expanded into oil and gas, uh, since we already had refining covered, and also that covers gas processing. And so we added the upstream component a few years ago where we're covering the, when they're actually, after they've drilled the wells and they complete it, then we've got operators to maintain the wells and to, to maximize production. And we also have petroleum engineering. Uh, water and wastewater treatment was added just uh, recently, and that's an online program to really cover that could be water treatment in any uh, city or municipality across the country. All of these are associate degree programs, and then we do have one bachelor's degree in energy management, and it's entirely online. And you can see we've got a lot of programs online, and then certainly a, a fair share on campus, and I'll show you in a little bit kind of how we do the online. Because I know a lot of times it's hard to get your head around, you know, technical training in an online environment, but it, it does work. This just shows a summary of our students in the last fiscal year, so almost 1,600 students all over the country. Certainly North Dakota is our largest population. Uh, we definitely have Canadian students and some other students in, in other parts of the, of the world. Uh, but definitely, we normally have all 50 states covered. Sometimes we're missing one or two states, but um, a definitely good national presence. Uh, we have uh, other programs that aren't in the Energy Center, but are certainly uh, great programs that support the industry through electronics, engineering tech, um, GIS, HVAC, welding, so all traditional programs that are also very good. Uh, we do a lot of non-credit training uh, for industry and we're seeing a, a growing need for this. Uh, sometimes they just want employees to have a certain course or a series of courses uh, versus the whole degree and that's been good. Uh, we're certified with uh, apprenticeship programs and we do a lot of work with industry on those. And this is a map of the non-credit students, so about 800 students in the last fiscal year. Certainly 300 in North Dakota, so big presence here, but we're still doing a lot of training across the country, and a lot of it's due to our online programs. Uh, so snapshot of some of the com companies that we deal with, uh, national companies, and certainly we've got a lot of companies and partners in North Dakota. They have North Dakota operations and, and other places around the country. Okay, so this is the, the fun part. Hopefully the technology will work. So we wonder how do we do online training? So I'm gonna show you a couple things that we do. We have our own developers in-house where they actually uh, write the code and they work with faculty to develop different online simulations and animations so that students are able to get a hands-on environment um, even though they're in a remote location. Just got a couple that I'll show you. Okay, this is a, a LACT unit. Uh, this would be really the cash register at the, the oil and gas well site. But you can see um, it's just a process flow. And we've got, um, we build things so that the students can see what's happening. Then the students would have examples of homework where they have to go in and they have to make changes or changes occur, they have to explain why. But it's just a, a simple flow diagram that would go into, um, you could show the, the good oil, shows the bad oil flow, you know, if the oil doesn't meet the specs, then it's gonna have to go back through the processing again. But just a simple example, but you can see, you know, this, it comes to life. The students can see it, they can see inside the vessel, they can see how things are gonna flow. So when they get onto a well site, they're gonna know what it looks like uh, behind the scenes within the equipment. Uh, we've got pumping units. I won't show this one, but you know, it's fully operational. Uh, students can learn how does it operate, learn about it. We do audio, video, uh, text, so all kinds of different things. This is a 3D of a saltwater disposal. Uh, we've got lots of other things too, so I'll show another. 
example. And I'll just skip ahead on this one. Knowledge virtual water treatment plant. In this extra so I'll just skip ahead. Medical problems or it's maintenance. The water, treatment facility the water level in the wet well is continuously monitored to make sure there is sufficient water level for efficient pump operation. Holds the lime feed. The soda ash feed is set at a specific feed yeah. rate. Le I won't go through all that, but you can see, you know, we're, we've got developers that can basically take a water treatment plant or any facility and make it in real life. And the students can go into it, they can learn about it, they hear about it, they they read about it, um, like a wind project, for example. Uh, we had built this, a typical wind farm. I'm gonna skip ahead so you can see some of the pictures. But now we're climbing, so you could actually climb from the bottom all the way to the top. And this would be just like you're going through the process, but you're not actually sweating when you're out in the middle of the summer and it's 100 degrees inside there. But it's just a, another way to enhance learning and to engage students and to, for them to be able to experience it just like they were actually climbing the facility. And then you know, it gets to the top, up into the nacelle, shows the different equipment, and there's you know, a video that goes along with it too. Uh, they get out on the top of the, the turbine, and you know, it's probably a good idea to see what it's gonna look like before you actually climb out there, so you know where you need to tie down uh, for safety reasons. But just a, a simple example of some of the things that we do. Uh, we have also, let's see, I'll back up. Uh, we have real equipment in the labs. Welcome to Bismarck State College and the National Energy Center of Excellence, Web Lab. Today we're going to talk about Web Lab. Web Lab, I'm going to skip the Web Lab process. To if we want to do a simple exercise so we where we try to get one gallon lab, of flow per minute and then through this built system, it to where you can operate we can go it ahead and get those valves and lined up and get that flowing. And operate this so let's lab. go ahead and give and you're that a try. Moving we'll get our valves lined up here. The bottom tank and through the whole process. So it's a way Set of our flow control valves. operating equipment. Set our controller set point at one gallon per minute. And then we have other... Um, remote laboratories as well. We have Web Lab, which this is um, located in, down on the second floor, and it's actually a train, and it's set up for people that are learning about transmission and uh, distribution. And they're actually, they go through the exercises, and when they're at the end of it, they actually power the train, they turn the lights on in the city. There's feedback uh, down on the bottom. It's actually modeled like a hydro plant, uh, but they're actually getting real feed time. The camera's on the train. When it goes in the tunnel, it's dark, so it, it's kind of a fun way to engage students. Uh, we have full simulators of coal plants, nuclear plants, um, and that's been a good enhancement as well. A uh, couple other things that we've done, we've worked on a smart grid project. We had a, a grant from Department of Energy, and we just finished it uh, last year. But we have a, a very small wind turbine on campus. It's about two kilowatts. We couldn't have a large one because we're in the flight path of the, the airport. We have a small solar system, it's about eight KW, and that's just right outside of this building. You can actually see it, and I think you can see the wind turbine if you look out the, the west windows. Uh, very small, but it's used really for demonstration purposes. We had funding from MDU, Department of Commerce, uh, to be able to build these things. The students can learn about it. Um, industry can pull data to see how efficient it is, how effective, what are the capacity factors, you know, looking at the costs. Uh, so I've got a couple of these, and I can show you you know, what it has been built so that the students can, can see what's occurring. So this is showing our solar panel. We've got two units um, outside. One is producing, and these are in watts. Uh, so they're very small, but it shows what the production is. You can go in, and you can look at what's occurred, let's say, for this whole year. We'll go back to January through today, and you can see what... Um, you know, what kind of production has, has gone on every day. The students can extract the data. They could use it for, you know, math type ex exercises or something that's in the engineering tech. But it's a good way to be able to see what's occurring, how is solar performing versus wind, how does it perform versus baseload coal. And the conclusion is, I mean, obviously the baseload coal is very cost effective, very stable. It runs pretty much 24-7. You know, the solar and wind, the costs are coming down. 
but they're still not available 24-7. Um, so there's you know, been pros and cons when you look at it. Uh, the wind, I'm not going to go into that because I'm guessing it's probably not um, producing much today. Yeah, you can see it's a nice calm day, uh, but we've got the, all the historical data there. And then we've also um, put smart meters into um, the found BSC Foundation House, which is just located on the other side of the, the parking lot. So we can monitor what's occurring in the, in the foundation uh, facility. They do have a kitchen. Looks like maybe the dishwasher must be on. You can see a little bit of uh, power is used there. But it's basically looking at how are we using our energy. We can monitor what's occurring, see where we could have some ways to become more efficient. OK, I mentioned you know we started our our power program in a garage in Mandan. Well, we have a garage here too. It's located outside of this building, very small. But we have, in the garage, we're housing a smart car. And I always have to think how, how ridiculous that probably would have sounded for those that started the, the power program to think someday we would actually have a, a smart car and we would have battery storage and we would be you know, powering vehicles based off of electricity. But we have a small car. Um, we also have a, a biodiesel trainer in our facility, we produce biodiesel, and so we can actually use that biodiesel to help to, um, to charge um, in the, the facility. We do it through natural gas and, and di biodiesel. But it's kind of a cool way for the students to be able to see how do you do more things with energy and what types of possibilities might exist in the future. You know, there are definitely limitations. I mean, the car can't go very far without needing a recharge, but it's a cool way to demonstrate, here you are taking electricity you can store it, albeit in a small amount, and then be able to utilize it for, for many other things. So it's kind of a fun way to, to be able to look at how do we utilize the different aspects of energy and, and putting it into things that are, are going to be part of our future. So just in summary, and I, I know I won't go into all the detail because I know you've got a full schedule today, but um, we, you know, we do see things moving in the direction of more emphasis on technical training. You know, definitely there's value placed on students that are coming out of college in two years or less and getting a technical degree. They're definitely needed in the industry to be able to operate all the facilities and to, for us to keep our lights on and to keep things affordable. Um, we're definitely moving towards more of a skill-based and workforce-based um, environment versus a traditional, um, you have to do this or you have to do that, and it's you know semester-based. We're seeing more skill-based and more competencies, and people moving into stackable credentials. Maybe they get a certificate in a program, then they get an associate degree, then they get a bachelor's degree, or they get certificates within a specific discipline, um, like IT. They have lots of different certificates they can, can get and be certified to, to be able to do their jobs. Uh, we're moving towards more active and collaborative learning, and that's what I just showed you, a couple of examples. We're trying to engage students where it's not just stand and lecture, because we know that can be kind of boring sometimes when you don't have interaction and you don't know what the students are learning. So we're trying to implement ways that they can have interaction and engagement um, throughout their, their education where it's not just a, a one-way dialogue. Uh, we're definitely leveraging technology through animations and simulations, like I showed, and, and we definitely have a whole bunch of things that have been built and, and are used. And um, also realizing the fact that we have to be flexible. A lot of students have to work or they want to work. Um, so you can't just have an eight to five type offering to accommodate for everybody. We have several older than average students, um, non-traditional students that do work in the industry, but they, didn't, uh, they have never gotten in a, a degree or they're maybe in a different area in their facility and they want to pursue, pursue an, an education path or training. So we've had to be flexible and and make sure we're adapting to all that. So with that, I know it's been quick and it's not really tied to what your, your conference is focused on, but I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about what we're doing. I'll leave you with this last quote, because um, I think it applies really for everybody. You know, we now accept the fact that learning is a lifelong process, keeping abreast of change, and the most pressing task is really to teach people how to learn. 
you know, we're evolving. So many things are changing. Technology is changing all the time. So it, for us, it's really imperative that we, we train the students and we are teaching them so that they're going to be able to continue learning uh, when they come to work for you or they, they go out into, into the industry. So with that, I'll open it up for any couple of questions. Does anybody have any, any questions of Carrie? <clears throat> Okay. Well, well first of all, I think it's an awesome facility. Obviously, I'm prejudiced because I went to school here too, but uh, obviously having a, a campus like this that continues to grow, um, the challenges are starting to run out of space too, right? <laughs> yes. We, I mean, we definitely have filled up the building, um, and we're you know, looking at, well, do we convert classrooms to more lab space? We have some labs up here on the, the fourth floor. Uh, so it's a good problem to have. Uh, the students are definitely in high demand. The jobs are amazing um, so we're, we're in a good situation but you know we always there's always challenge with growth yes this was a question Wait, you got <laughs> you mentioned that there was Canadian students uh, in your programs and I just wondered how you get the word out to Canadians because it looks like a wonderful program well, thank you and that's marketing we don't have a huge budget for marketing so marketing can be a challenge a lot of times our students find out from word of mouth uh, and we're dealing with the industry. You know, we might deal with, you know, some of the companies in Canada and maybe they hear about us. We might meet them. You know, you know we've got Canadian companies that are part of the North Dakota Lignite Council. Uh, but that's the hard part to, to market. But it's usually word of mouth, um, students and graduates. And we've had thousands of students graduate from our programs. Um, so a lot of times that's kind of how the connections happen. And then things like this too, where there's an opportunity to meet people from other places in the country, and sometimes that helps to, to get the word out, too. Thank you. You mentioned the distance learning part of this. Mm -hmm. Do they do some distance learning and then attend here as well? Is that the process? Or can they do it all from... Uh, some remote? of the programs, they can do it entirely online. Okay. Like nuclear, for example, yeah. they wouldn't even have to come to Bismarck no. okay. uh, ever. We do no. everything online. Okay. Uh, some of our programs we have online, but we require a hands-on component at the end. Yeah. Okay. And we will match them up. If they're in Texas, we'll find a facility. Um, maybe it's, if they're in the power program, we'll find a power plant nearby or some other industrial mm -hmm. facility. And then we'll get them into the plant to do some hands-on right. at the end of their, okay. their program, like a capstone. Yeah. Because it and, doesn't take as much room here. Right. When you have a lot of these students out on. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a cost-effective way to do it. Too. Right. Okay. But we're building, you know, through technology, we're trying to, you know, enhance that. So that Expand, they, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that technical experience. Okay. And then we do have some students that um, they are on campus for part of some of their classes, and then they do some classes online. And we're seeing that emerging as a trend, too. Um, and even in the, the other programs on campus, um, you know, sometimes students have to work. So they can't take English 110 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. They're working um, in the afternoon, so they'll do that online. So it's a nice way that they can pick and, and decide what's best for them. So thank you all. Thanks, Carrie.